housekeeping. If you can keep your mics on mute, um, unless you're speaking, that would be much appreciated. It keeps the, the quality of the recording high. Um, but you can screen share if you wish when you're reading. Or if you're just here to, to listen, it's fantastic that you're, you've come along tonight. Maybe you can, you can join in the reading fun next time. So we're growing as a group massively. We've got over 300 members now, and it's still my intention to have potentially um, in-person readings and some printed anthologies in due course um, as we continue to expand and explore this space. So thank you so much once again. And for those people who've just arrived, this meeting, our fourth meeting, has the theme of water. And I'm going to start by introducing our, our guest reader, um, Rishi Dastidar. And it's a great privilege to introduce Rishi. Um, he's known, you know, internationally anyway. I'm sure you all have come along to hear him and you're very excited to hear his words. But Rishi's um, been published by the Financial Times and the BBC. Um, He's had several poetry collections published. Um, the first one, Ticker Tape, featured a poem in the Forward Book of Poetry five years ago. And he's had two collections with Nine Arches Press. Firstly, Saffron Jack, published in 2020, and Neptune's Projects, published in April this year. Really encourage you to read these books, they're amazing. But he's a fellow of the Complete Works and a consulting editor of the Rialto. Um, he's also editor of The Craft, A Guide to Making Poetry Happen um, in the 21st Century, published by Nine Arches. Um, he's a co-editor of Too Young, Too Loud, Too Different from Malika's Poetry Kitchen, published by Corsair. So he's incredibly busy and this is only, you know, probably a a fraction of his activities. Um, he's a keen runner and sports fan, so I like that very much. Um, um, so the floor is yours, Rishi. Give us your best. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Stephen. Um, thank God I'm in the room, right? Otherwise, my head would be far too big to actually get through the door frame. Take everything that Stephen said with a massive <laughs> pinch of salt. But that was uh, hugely kind. And it's hugely kind of you as well to um, come along this evening. So thank you for that. Um, so, yeah, water. Most of, of the water I'm going to focus on is the sea. Um uh, yeah, mainly because I'm going to be reading mostly from, yeah, in fact, in its entirety from um, Neptune's project. Uh, I must confess that I forgot the chemical part of the and the chemistry part of the brief. So if I manage to hit that across the next um, 15 minutes or so, um, that will be by chance rather than design. But hey, chance is good. Um let me start with this first poem because it gives you a sense and a vibe of what's going on in the book and helps to explain some of the premise and the ideas that are floating behind it. It's called Solaris, a sequel. One. What does a god, now simply a mascot for a sports team, dream of? Others dream of the lovers who were, lovers that could have been, a life of potential epics. Or maybe even ones real to them, coming back to them once, a precious, almost lost drift of bliss in an endless desert of never taken chances. Or maybe every night an immersion in the best times they ever had. And so why would you ever want to leave? Why would you ever want to lose any aspect of that memory? Instead, Fight the attempt to put time into folder-shaped chunks that fit easily into filing cabinet-shaped cortexes. Instead, revel in the endless possibility of time, life with her, that was all suggested by that lingering kiss under a station railway clock in what we used to call Versailles about 500 years ago. Two. You would think that a planet awash with the substance I am in charge of, that I control, the elemental force that makes me, me, 
that I would draw strength from that. All powerful and unopposed, the world is now me. I am now the world. All of this is my work, so I am mighty and you should despair. Trouble is, I despair too. I am not mighty. I am overwhelmed. Turns out that I needed something, land, any land, more land than this, to define myself against. My force needed limits to extend its range, to shape it into something useful. And there is not enough of it to mean something to me. Instead, I sit here drifting, waiting for the next match to begin. Three, I don't have dreams anymore. I just absorb the ones that everyone tells me, like in some way I can give them comfort, consolation, absolution, joy. Once, maybe, I could have done when things, events, the world were more in my command. But the secret is, I am as much adrift as you. So the premise is that, or not the premise, but should we say um, the the main character who is floating around, pun intended, this book is Neptune, God of the Sea. Um, weary, forlorn, sarcastic, angry at his favourite species um, who've decided to do what they're doing, the, to trash the sea and the planet. and don't really seem to give a damn about it and you know and actually as he discovers through the course of the book he's pretty powerless to do much if anything about it and so many if not a lot of the poems you know hinge and focus around that sort of idea and that sort of voice and as you could tell from that he um I've given him a voice which is, yeah, at once lamenting, but also can be quite vituperative, sardonic as well. Um, but also just, yeah, often quite um, plain speaking, wondering at the at the um, the slight strangeness of these jumped up mammals. Um, this next poem will give you a sense of that. It's after, um, if you know the German um, artist Gerhard Richter, it's after one of his works, uh, Seascape CC, um, and the poem is called Neptune's Polaroids. The sea is above me, the sea is below me. Who needs the filter of a sky? These rollers resist narrative, metaphor, the beautiful, the beautiful thing is not being sure. Reality becoming as fuzzy as a sleep round its edges, imperfect in its perfections. I am febrile and I allow for the failure of your iceberg hunting expedition. Hesitancy is a curse, but so is questing. And modernity is rusting in me. Or is that resting? You can have the dream. All I want is the light and a girl with a green hairband to read me the shipping forecast as I drift off. I'm jumping ahead now. Um, obviously, it's hard right now to not um, look at what's going on in the planet, uh, yeah, with the planet, with ambient air temperature, sea temperature, and not feel a little scared um and so i have partly jokingly but then not jokingly talked about this book being not even eco poetics but beyond that we're in a, we're at apocalypse poetics now and those are the sort of terms which we should be thinking about um some of you might think find that bleak i find that quite blackly amusing um, i don't know if that says something about my cast of mind um and these next two, um, yeah, dance around those sorts of poles, um, the um, the despair of humour, but also the ability to survive using that as well. The first of these two is called Test Card Heatwave. Mostly what I see is the fuzzy sort of nothing that comes from seeing too much too fast, 
a distinctly indistinct pattern which is insistently telling you that if you crack me do your signal stroke noise thing that apparently your temperament and talents make you well suited for so you kept being told by people who could read your eyes but not your heart well maybe you might well maybe you might just save the world oh but probably not i mean we've all seen the news the hot news the burning news the apocalypse won't be as warm as this news but you know the real headline is fortress europe can't keep out all the climate change migrants and all the brand onions you slice while wearing your thin on-trend suit won't put that into culture will it um and this is a more extended version of that tone a slightly different tone um i should say that um the, well you'll hear as i get into the poem but yeah it is mostly true what follows and the dream did happen and um yeah and the rest of it it's called new planet who dis of course poems that start oh this was a dream are dull but honestly this was a better than average one in that i dreamt it 38 years ago and i still not only remember it but carry it with me like a good luck charm though once i tell you about it you'll more likely think of it as an amulet of doom anyway i must have just watched 2001 and you know how fucked up that and so our future is I, I digress but i'm pretty sure the film triggered the dream though at this distance who knows who cares right anyway there i am floating not space walking space drifting space mooching space loitering oh hold on i've remembered what might be a contributory factor uh, sorry input strand to this dream reading a book of disasters hang on what was a book of disasters doing in a school library i mean was it a conscious attempt at priming us that violence mayhem fate and the unpredictable alliance between all three and the resulting random outputs of the only constant in life so get used to it kids anyway in this book was an account of how on their return from space some cosmonauts were in incinerated because the hatch on their capsule didn't shut properly and of course i should go to wiki to tell you more about this but this isn't that kind of poem and right now i'm kind of out of love with footnotes i mean how much baggage am i actually meant to carry on this whole living trip anyway i'm space loitering space hanging about when i start falling falling not dramatically with a flourish arms waving that kind of thing no more proverbial more like the proverbial i say proverbial did he actually drop one didn't he stone pebble that galileo dropped next to the feather like that straight down spirit level down plumb line down lift shaft down oh maybe towering inferno is somewhere in this mix too remember all the flames up the lift shaft making faye dunaway's eyebrows shoot up anyway the point is, I'm going down and I'm going and going, still inside the spacesuit, no rotating or piking or somersaulting, just arrow, ramrod, cannonball, whatever, sonic boom through all the wispy hair bits of the atmosphere, not slowing down even though I know the physics say it says I am, and not burning up either, just a white heat Michelin man with a body born hoover and a grudge and on and on, even though it makes it sound endlessly slow, which it wasn't, because then there is a desert no canyon type thing arid not sandy and definitely a cactus and land without leaving a mark on the ground not a trace a thud on impact a sound not a dust smoke an atom disturbed and i pop the visor on my suit and i find i have become a coyote hyena a wolf what you want a moral too fuck off There's a lot of swearing in the book, I should, I should say that. Am I proud of that? I'm not proud of that. Maybe I'm proud of that a bit. Um, right, I've, I'm going to skip over the large political section of the book, um, but I will tell you that I re read a poem from that um, in a commuter town south, you know, in the south, in the home counties, and it bombed um yeah <laughs> but i just skip towards the back of the book and i'm going to read one because i know stephen uh likes it so for you stephen this is bark of frailty oh thanks bark of frailty full of reformed rakes and bookish hearts block of fealty full of knees doffing and hats bending barker of fantasy full of bodies memories and memories body Baroque of felony, full of fire curves and wavering sin. Byzantine of fertility, full of ground awakenings and blue sighs. Burst of fragility, full of hairline universes and breaking beats. Bloom of futility, full of pause buttons and waiting rooms. 
brioche of flexibility full of lifted crusts and spongy beds. Bridal of fashionability, full of revolving time and entropy's glitter. Bulb of formidability, full of electric, -like, ne electric lights never off since 1901. Blush of facility, full of a click's ease and railway charm. Burial of falli fallibility, full of re resurrected promises and wave logic. Brick of feasibility, full of home lies and silent explosions. Buyer of false ability, full of nothing much and everything, everything. And I jump from that to something that is far more sensible. Um, uh, yeah, everyone, I'm sure, wrote or tried to write during lockdown. I wrote this when I was literally sitting here with the view that I have now of um, that garden and the garage opposite and the little patch of wasteland outside. And it was, yeah, it was weather pretty much like this, pretty still, pretty calm, pretty sunny. The poem's called Dow. Are you bored yet? Bored of your desk, your window, the same vista, not even a breeze to make the starling fly faster? I am bored of performing when I should be meeting. I don't know where my eyes even go anymore. Only boring people are ever bored, a boring person once said. And sure, my imagination isn't locked down. But then all I could think about was being on a Dow right now. A Kamal for a heart. A Latine, the only future. The infinite, same, different from this. I can't even swim. I should have told you that a Dow is... Um, a type of shit, a boat that sails across the Arabian Ocean. Yes, exactly. Exactly, Rosie. That's it. You got it. So, yeah. Um, I, I should really be better at explaining things before rather than after I've read the poem. But hey-ho. Um, <laughs> uh, two more. Two more. Let's um, let's give you another one in the voice of um, Neptune. Uh, this is towards the back of the book. Um and yeah, I guess we're coming coming to some sort of conclusion. And I imagine this as um, almost questions that might be asked in any future court case when this whatever species are surviving do the whole thing of of trying to find out what the hell happened to the humans. Um, and it started from a quote from Jacinda Ardern, the former Prime Minister of New Zealand, when she said at some point, Australia has to answer to the Pacific. And that sparked this. It's called Tridency, or an Inquisition by the Sea. What is an anchor to you? Gaia WhatsApped the other day. She said, darling, isn't it wonderful? You're getting all this extra space without having to do a thing. What did I say back? Flotsam and jetsam, lagan and derelict. Shipwreck, shipwreck. Species wreck, species wreck. I asked for a seahorse to be put into your brains. Why do you not listen to it? Why are you going back to space when, like an over-exuberant, under-technique teenage boy, you've only revealed 5% of me? Peace is to Pacific as Atlantis is to Atlantic, as Apocalypse is to blank, question mark. Would you get it more if I tattooed a plimsoll line on your foreheads? What if I told you a rigorous market-based answer is also the solution to the problem? What if I told you I'm not wine dark, but angry whiskey living boiling, mate? What will you do in the Nova Sea? If you love me like you say you do, why are you treating me like this? Doesn't it always feel faster at the end? And I shall take my leave with this. Um, um, football's back. Premier League starts on Friday. Um, I'm an Everton fan for my sin. It's my very, very big sin. So um, this feels like it's going to be a pretty accurate write-up of how the next 38 weeks are going to go. Um, thank you so much for listening. It's been a real joy to be with you. 
And I shall leave you with this. The poem is called Neptune Clough. The previous manager had suffered the catapult inevitable after the weekend's mauling. Despite his pleas for a vote of confidence, he was ushered over the ramparts with a twang and a cheery, it's not cold. One match left, a win required between this boyhood passion, this money sink of a mistress and oblivion. Who could rally the men, lift the burden of heavy light that oppressed them all? It was a watery hand that dotted the contract with a conch dipped in squid ink. The chairman gave Neptune only one command. The knights in this town are coloured grey. You, my son, are the ibuprofen. Saturday comes expansive in its possibility. The glory on offer to those who wield the dagger expertly enough. Five minutes before kickoff and the jobbing god has lined up not some last minute tactical advice, but a candlestick of gin for everyone. Drink, drink for courage to see the glowing vision of the future that awaits on this parsley perfect pitch in 90 minutes time. Doesn't even take that long. At 4.27pm, Nob, Nobby Nobs, rises at the far post to meet Larson B's expertly weighted cross with the broadsword of his forehead. And with that, Neptune rises from his rocking chair in the dugout, throws his trident into the sky and runs down the tunnel to avoid the ice bucket celebrations breaking out on every side of the ground. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank um, you, everyone. Very kind. Yeah. I'm just trying to work out where Sean Dyche fits into the poem there. We <laughs> the end. <laughs> I, again, I, I'll let you know in January when he, when he, when he eventually gets you know, fired over the ramparts. <laughs> That's the Everton manager, everyone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, fantastic. I, I love um, the poems in Neptune projects. The they're so imaginative, and you really do get immersed in this sort of dangerous universe that we. That we live in. Um, do go and buy a copy, everyone, if you haven't read it. It's fantastic. Um, yeah, so once again, please join me in appreciation for Rishi um, and his reading. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Wow, fantastic. Um, yeah, so we've got um, some additional um, readers before our break. We have four readers. Um, and the first one is Miranda Lynn Barnes. Um, She's well known to Molecules Unlimited and to many of you, I'm sure. Um, Miranda um, actually recently was awarded second place in the Verve Poetry Competition, which is great. And she's had um, collections published with V Press, Blue Dot Abada, and I wrote formulations with her that was published last year, um, published by Small Press. She is the editor of Consilience. Um, um, she's a well one of the editors and she's a, a, a researcher educator and has published in many other places as well so without further ado I'll give you over to Miranda thank you very much Stephen um, and uh, can everyone hear me okay yeah okay cool um, so I'm going to read a couple poems and one of them um, I wrote for the evening and it came from a uh, an article that I read and basically the title tells the story of that article. It's a quantum experiment reveals photosynthesis begins with a single particle of light. All it takes, just one photon, a single shiny crumb. The herald holds back while its fluorescent consort sends up a flare from anywhere. Proof the quanta splits the water in a, man, in a manner only Moses could mimic, only in miniature, a minuscule corpuscle. Then hydrogen hides in the dark, slicking itself with sweetness, feeding the green. And there you are, the light shining, each scintilla of air billowing towards you, crashing like a wave into your lungs. So I was just kind of inspired about 
the interactions of water and light um, and in this particular discovery and and how it can just be such a tiny fragment of reality that makes this this happen that creates all the life that we we know of through that combination um, and sort of following on from that uh, I thought I would read a poem that it came about as a as a result of a, a collaboration I did with Tanya Hirschman many years ago that that never actually thank you Stephen uh, that never actually got published anywhere um, but was a lot of fun uh, we played with creating uh, forms from physics, um, which inspired me to to work on the formulations project with Stephen. Um, and so this is a sort of more of a physics angle, uh, no pun intended, but it's about how the light hits water in a glass and and refracts. So it's 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 looking at that. And in the shape of the poem, it's reflected as well. A ray of light is incident on the surface of the water as shown. Your eyes glint against the glass as raindrops do in puddles outside the sliding back doors. We are polarized on opposite ends of the day. I sleep and you're awake as I was before. A swing shift of the worst kind, reminding me of years spent in lesser lonelinesses. The bed is bleak and cold. You start your day in the coming dark. I'm Dusk's cold sister and you're downstairs wishing for an arc. In the autumn days shortening, it seems like a week since we last shared a morning kiss. The incident on the water is light, rays on the surface. Mm. I know the break in our days came on Monday. It's only Tuesday. At midnight, I find you in the kitchen making tea and rain is glossing the windows with bits of gold while drops provoke a thrum from metal drums outside. It is an easy silence that we know, a press of lips that comes with slowly wrapping arms around. Peace glows from your eyes, born of this incandescence between us that pays no mind to ours. We know there are stars above the water. On the surface is a ray of light. Thank you. Thank you, Miranda. Lovely. Wonderful. Okay. We're going to move on now to our second um, open mic reader, which is Clodagh Beresford Dunn. And Clodagh is also well known to Molecules Unlimited and read last time as well. She um, is a poet, lawyer and writer and um, was awarded the Arts Council of Ireland Emerging Writer first three. Um, and she read Seven Sugar Cubes last time, which was voted Irish Poem of the Year, the 2017 Irish Book Award. And she's also um, winner of the UK Clarissa Luard Award in 2019 for Emerging Irish Writers. So over to you, Clodagh. Thanks, Stephen. Um, I hope it's really nice there. It's lovely in Southern Ireland tonight. It's probably the only nice evening we've had in about seven weeks. So it was, um, it's, it's typical. The moment you go on Zoom, the sun comes out, you know. Um, thank you, uh, Rishi and Miranda, for such beautiful poems. Um, I particularly love Bark of Frailty. That's one of my favourites too, uh, Rishi. I'm so glad I got to hear it. Um, so... Uh, I'm just going to read a short poem because uh, this theme was water. Uh, this poem I wrote on International Pi Day a few years ago. That's the mathematical Pi Day. Um, and I never really liked uh, geometry in school. But for some reason, you know, when you become an adult, things make more sense to you. And one of the one of the um, facets of Pi that I was reading about in an article in the newspaper was a thing called sinuosity which is where a river meanders. So it's a sort of the principle of minimum expenditure of energy, basically. And um, that's where the poem came from. It appeared in uh, the University of Salzburg Poetry Review uh, this year, just gone, actually. So it was there with a few other poems. So I was very pleased about that. And it's called Lifting the River. You discovered mathematical sinuosity on a Sunday. 
The way a river snakes like an S into dreamy meander. And how, if it was possible to lift it from the soil, a loop of fluid would hang like liquidy ribbon and become from its source to the ocean, if carefully opened out, a complete and perfect circle, a magnificent watery wheel on which we can now traverse the earth, grateful for all the bends and twists and added efforts it made. So that's my contribution to the water molecules meeting number four. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Claudia. Brilliant. Thank you. It's wonderful to hear all of these interpretations of the of the theme. Um, right, let's move on to Kathleen McPhillamy, um, who's joining us from the Oxford area. Um, Kathleen grew up in Belfast um, um, and has launched the very successful um, Poetry Worth Hearing podcast, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard and has proven to be very successful. She's published several collections of poetry as well, such as Lion in the Forest, um, Backcountry and Attentive Peace. Lovely to have you here, Kathleen. Over to you. Oh, <clears throat> can you hear me? Good. I, um, I, I'm a little bit flustered because I've just dashed back from Bristol and literally come in the, uh, the door uh, about five minutes ago. But I'm going to read two poems. The first one was written for um, an exhibition in, in Oxford called The Flow of Water, which was celebrating the um, Oxford Turin link. And this poem is called The Colours of Water. Water when pure is a little bit blue. The water when gone is yellow as straw. Water returns green as grass. The memory of water is soft in the meadow. Water in the sky is black and gray, falls as needles slipping down glass. Water in the city is the lights of travel, silence of streams buried in culverts. Water in the Sahel, is red as dried earth, white as bones baked into the riverbed. The water of floods is the color of loss, livelihoods bobbing in mud and scum. Water still on the poles and mountaintops, blinding whiteness of snow and ice. Water yearned for is blue unmitigated and hope is the color of a man's hand. Water of the sea, all colours and no colour, red as the rising and setting sun, dark as night, silver as moonlight, water as waves reflecting the rainbow. And the next, the next poem is um, kind of uh, prompted indirectly by Stephen because I'm um, Stephen gave me a suggestion and it's turned into a, um, a project where I'm writing about the history and geology of County Antrim in, in Northern Ireland. And um, it's a project that's going in all sorts of directions, but one of the things that keeps coming up is water and rivers. So this is a poem called H2O. Water is ice dragging itself over land to round the drumlands, make fertile fields. Water is sea curving round sills of dolerite formed when the earth boiled over. Water is rivers pouring from hills and mountains to power the mills. Water is the surge of tide into bucket holes that brings us salt. Water is the dammed stream or dug ditch that rets the flax. Water is mother of steam whose father is fire. Water is two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen, 55% of us. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Yeah, um, really quite scientific as well. So amazing. <laughs> lovely, lovely poems. Um, Marvellous. So we've got one more reader before the 
the interval, and that's Peter Rowe. Um, Peter lives in Bridport um, and is well known as a poet, a performance poet, filmmaker, and writer. Um, he published his debut collection five years ago, Technology Bites Back. Um, he's been runner up in the Bridport Short Story Slam in 2018. And other highlights include um, he, he was winner of the Western Gazette Best Local Writer in 2017. He has a second collection, I'm in Love with My Barista. Um, and he's also co host of Bridport Spoken Word Event, Apothecary. Um, and has been the second bard at Dorchester as well. So lots of strings to his bow. So over to you, Peter. Thank you, Stephen. <clears throat> right, um, I, I'm not even gonna try and explain this one. I'm just gonna read it. And uh, I think it's the story's in there. It's called An Inquiry About Drops of Water. My friend Caroline said to me, I'll tell you something you never see, and that's Sylvia Plath in a charity shop. I had to disagree. Just the week before, I found Sylvia cheek by jowl with Ted in Oxfam in Bridport, and I didn't have the heart to split them up, so I took them both home. And now they're sharing space in my rented place, shoulder to shoulder, shelf partners together again, and I have to consider the coffee I drank in the bookshop in Hebden Bridge, the beers I had in the local pub. And I wonder if any of the drops of water have been through the water cycle, evaporation, condensation, precipitation, transpiration. Do you think it's possible that I could have Ted in my head and Sylvia in my heart? This one's called Wild Swimming. Does a raindrop falling from mountain clouds have any concept of self? Or does it tumble in empty intent from sky to rocky shelf? How does it find its twisting way in burbling stream through languid tarn and tumbling brooks to find itself in mirrored lake where summer's wind riffles water's drops in soft, gentle waves? Does it know this place where wild swimmers go, wading out on gently shelving shore, thigh high in cool, mountain fed water? fingers breaking surface tension, teasing the mirrored surface. This place where sky and hills kiss the lake with looking glass reflections. Does the water feel the vital spark of the mermaid hearts who step slowly into this infinite pool? Does it feel the rush and pulse of their veins, the beat of their hearts? celebrating water's fantastic journey to this one perfect moment. And I have a very short one now, it's called, When Did You Last See the Rain? When did you last see the rain? Was it that time when you heard the rain, turned and you said, it's raining again, but did you see the rain? When did you last see the magic in the rain? When did you last feel the O in H2O? When did you last watch the raindrops bursting on the ground, splashing their essence in a final embrace with Mother Earth? When did you last feel the sunshine on your face after you had seen the rain? Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Amazing. Lovely, lovely poems there. Thank you. Um, great. Well, I would just want everyone, if you may, to um, share your appreciation for everyone who's read so far. Thanks. Thanks again, everyone. Um, we're going to have a short break now until I think five to eight. That's OK. Go and grab 
a drink or whatever, and we'll reconvene for part two. Thanks again. Do we keep do we keep the Zoom open? I would assume so. Sorry, whoever asked that probably easiest. Yeah, just blank, blank your video. <laughs> Yeah, we'll just use the same link, so it's it's active.
Hello. Hey everyone. Yeah, welcome back. Um, I guess we all had something with water in it to drink. <laughs> um, Actually, not yet. <laughs> unless you really go for the hard stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, so wonderful um, to continue with these water themed poems. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next reader, um, Mandy Haggith, who um, spends a lot of time on the water, actually, up in the Northwest Highlands. Um, if you haven't read her book, Briny, I hugely recommend it by Red Squirrel Press. Mm. It came out last year. Lots of poems about the sea in there. Um, but Mandy is um, a poet, a, um, a writer of fiction and nonfiction. Um, she's had several collections of poetry, I think five, um, of which the most recent is Briny. Um, so, yeah. Without further ado, um, I'll give you Mandy Haggif. Thanks very much, Stephen. It's a real um, privilege and a pleasure to be here as always. Um, and yeah, just to listen to these wonderful watery poems. Um, as, you, as Stephen said, I spend a lot of time on the sea. I'm a very keen sailor. And, um, and in fact, I've just come in from the sea today um, and spent last night at anchor in one of my favorite um, anchorages in the Summer Isles. Um, looking out at one of the most splendid views um, from an anchorage that I know. It's down out across Loch Broom, across the Summer Isles, to the, um, the, the Letter U Hills and to Kayak Point. Um, Kayak is a Gaelic um, crone goddess um, attributed with um, creating the world, but also she's the... She's the um, the hag of um, storms and bad weather and danger at sea, amongst other things. And um, there are quite a few um, dangerous points of, of land sticking out into the sea that are that are called um, Rukoi um, Kayak, um, um, presumably because she's presiding over them. And this is um, one of them. So um, that's worth explaining. And the um, and I guess the other sort of danger and chemistry related thing in, in the poem is um, luciferin, which is the, um, the, the chemical um, that causes um, bioluminescence um, in the, well, in lots of things, but in particular that bioluminescence that we see in the sea. So this is night at sea. Drawn to the cockpit by a slow flash flash, I check the chart. The Kayak Point lighthouse blinks twice for an ancient danger. The mast props up a starry sky. The Milky Way, Silver River, flows countlessly overhead. The tide is falling and the surface sparkles with what I take to be reflected stars until I see they are alive. As ripples turn the sea skin over, its inhabitants flash their own warning. I stir a phosphorescent whirl of water sparks. This moonless night is lit, its darkness splendid, accepting our detritus, paying for it with diamonds. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mandy. Fantastic. Lovely to hear that poem and, and the context around it as well. Thank you. Um, Thank fantastic. You. So let's move on to uh, Neymar Chamchoun, um, um, who is a British Moroccan writer and poet, um, author of COVID, The Wordy Wilds of a Mind Under Lockdown. Um, over to you, Neymar. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm going to share two poems, which are, I suppose, mildly related to water. First poem, Global Warning. It must rain. This is insane. 
British weather synonymous with wet and glum, not tomorrow or the day after, not even next week, a sizzling tarmac, greedily drinking in the heat. Surely the heat must break. It has been too long. Unqu unquenched days, gasping for rain. 144 days and counting. Little or no rain as we writhe in our sheets, perspiring as the sleep retreats from the heat. The simmering air that clings to our skin. Farmers waiting for the heavens to open as their dehydrated crops curl. The grain, unable to sustain the world, burning forests, singeing the heavens. The memory of fresh crashing drops against the window, our skilled dissection of the misery blighty blood bestows. Rain, rain, go away, come again another day. The skin's longing for the sun, artificial warmth turned on. Rain, rain, come again, wash away our climate sins. The sky shuddered as the sighing showers came, first silently, then sliding on glass, teasing the grass, then clattering and colliding like a chorus of drums. The sliver of a stream winding through the gutters, frantically reaching and merging with the flow. A symphony of tinkling glass as they tumble below. Twisted brollies as the work weary run for cover. Advancing from soggy stroll, stro stro sorry. Advancing from soggy stroll to race. Water carries water, faster and faster swirling gloriously, picking up the pace, out of the flames and into the sun, its freshness washing away fatigue, our distressed gardens briefly relieved, an ocean of souls merging with the sea, caught between the floods and the fires, a, a flailing cycle of too much and not enough, Pledges of green swept away by commerce's thrust, helplessly watching as time expires. Thank you. And uh, the second piece, which I, I think has a, a watery uh, background, if nothing else. Perpetual parlance. We parlay on the plier. A quiescent blue rhapsody tablecloth with fluttering white trim. Beyond the cobblestone pier, la vie de la mer. Beyond what the eye sees, the air laced with grilled sardine, pierced by the scream of the lifeguard's whistling ire. A gelabatan figure unfurls his mat on the sand facing east southeast his hands raised to his head. You beam with the brilliance of the sun. Like the sea, the moment brims and runs into the horizon and mountains crowned in mist. Our words swallowed by the seabed as the waves crashed and curled. A rainbow ocean of palpitating parasols greet an angel blue sky. Streaks of gold and silver clutch at sunlight, polished by the sand's rough. The world is more than enough. Its troubles breezily pass us by. There is no darkness when the sun holds back the night and summer's sojourn cups the buds of the soul. We playfully parlay as the children run and splash. Their squeals of delight, cutting through the ear, air before finding our ears. Our words fisher and alight, card games and cigarette ash, warm plastic cups of Erte, fishing for seashell keepsakes in the resting baking grains, heat painted salty limbs, your chiseled salt shoulders uh, glisten and smolder. When the dream wakes, only shells remain, 
and our voices in the sea's basin where the spell never breaks. Thank you. Thank you, Neymar. Wonderful. Lovely to see you here. And um, yeah, this is fun, isn't it? Yeah, this is um, an enjoyable um, journey through water tonight. Um, so thank you, everyone, again. Our next reader is Evelyn Pye, who um, is one of those um, kind of poets with a, a mathematical or scientific um, viewpoint as well. She's from Glasgow. Um, she spent some time in Zambia and taught mathematics at Caledonian, Glasgow Caledonian University for um, a couple of decades. She's published in many poetry journals um, like The Interpreter's House um, and has two collections um, of poems, Smoke That Thunders by Mariscat Press in 2015 and Red Squirrel Press published her second collection, Steam, last year. So um, over to you, Evelyn. You're muted, Evelyn. You have to bear with me. I have COVID. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm half asleep and half awake at the moment. So where was I? Yes. Um, I will add a little bit of gravitas to my voice. Uh, displaced. I came home to this curve in the Clyde to feel the ease of water passing by. Watch ships slowly slip away, swathed in comfort, safe in my skin, bathed in the mutter of guttural words. But the climate has changed, the river swollen all winter, familiar smur replaced by torrents. Drains overflow and drench the soil. The rockery is dressed in dark green velvet. When I bought this house, I never thought to ask its elevation. I didn't investigate topography or worry about thermal expansion in our oceans, ice sheets melting in Antarctica. Now, when I drag my reluctant eyes across the latest flood maps, my road is paint spattered, a dark blue stain spreading closer ink spilled on glossy paper. No one knows how long I've got. In 20 years, the sea will rise another foot, or maybe three. I could live that long, but not here. I can't stay here. Um, the other poem I'd like to read is called Mother of the Sea. Um, I started off with the idea of really just writing about Kathleen Mary Drew Baker, um, 1901 to 1957. But what came out of the poem was a little bit more than that, more about the way science is considered in two different societies, the society in the UK and in Japan. Mother of the Sea, in memory of Kathleen Mary Drew Baker. For centuries, Japanese sea farmers plunged poles into shallow water, tied on homemade nets, harvested red seaweed for sushi. But after the war, the crops failed and they called it gambler's grass, walked on legs like knobbled sticks died on the beaches. Far away on a Welsh shore, Dr. Drew collected algae in old jam jars. 
grew lava in a tidal tank, discovered a culture cellist phase, leaf filaments bored into shelves, turned pink as Saturday night lipstick, ripe seeds ready to spore the sea, curled like caterpillars in the chrysalis. The pollination of pure science, a few lines in Nature magazine on the life cycle of Bofrera, written with no thought for the Japanese, led to artificial seeding. And soon sushi leaves were flapping like russet butterflies all along the hungry shoreline. Each year at cherry blossom time, a crowd gathers on a windy hilltop by the Ariaka Sea. Dr. Drew's academic gown is draped over her Shinto shrine. Branches of Sakaki, the holy tree, are laid on the altar with offerings of fish for the mother of the sea. Thank you. Thank you so much, Evelyn. That, that was wonderful. Um, really quite weighty stuff scientifically and moving poems and also a, a few nods to Rishi's um, sort of uh, eco-poetic angles as well. So thank you so much. Um, brilliant. And get get well soon. It's amazing that you're even here. Um, um, Frankie, thank you so much. Um, um, yeah, look after yourself. <laughs> um, okay, I've got a short poem now um, before I hand over to Rosie Barrett. Um, I was interested um, in exploring, is there something beneath water? So this is called Living Water. Living Water. I lurk beneath water's definition, glass ceiling above, glass bottom below, glass on my left and right. I drown in a gin, I drown in a rum. It is liquid for lunch with no smell of spirits. I form water's vertebrae and its shape, bending light above, bending light below, bending chemical scents. I swim the surface, I swim to the depths looking for a perfect blue in the visible range. I hold back from wetting the world of dry. Thirsts look for me here, thirsts look for me there. Thirsts are what I live for. I rinse this cosmos, I rinse these atoms. I wear colorless coats like molecular ghosts. I am at ease with earth, wind and fire, waves inside others, waves outside others, waves and cubes of water. I form the concave, I form the convex, I soak up lots of heat when the sun goes all grill. I surge through water, the waves touch my voice. Thank you. Okay, and now I think Rosie Barrett has um, Oh, um, Rosie um, was shortlisted for the Bridport Prize in 2017 and, and was commended in the Indigo Dreams pamphlet competition. She's published widely in anthologies and magazines um, and features in Call to the Edge, an anthology with other writers from the Plymouth area like Abigail Robinson. Thrilled you're with us as well, um, Rosie. So. Over to you. you. Yeah, and most recently, and I'll give it a plug, it's called Unearthing Dartmoor, and it was a collaboration between the Moor Poets and the uh, Mark Makers, and there, and it's it's beautiful, and Waterstones will, if, they, if, if you ask for it, they will actually give it to you, otherwise get it from me. <laughs> right, um, when the gulls are walking, not swimming, that's when we drive the tidal road. Egrets are a good clue, a rule of thumb as they pick their way round the potholes up to their ankles, fine. Elbows, not so good. 
our flocks of summer visitors get casual. Some ignore the triangle with the car tipping over the edge. The words impassable at times. In this time of extremes of doubt and flood, here we're blessed with only a hint of the future. We gather up the confused and bedraggled, dry them, warm them, whiskey and water them, offer them a place to sit where they can watch their pride and joy disappear briefly below the brackish water. Satnav doesn't always get it right. And <laughs> if you find that confusing, because I read it to someone the other day and they had no idea what I was talking about. I have actually, so I'll obviously have to work on it. I've sent you a couple of pictures and the poem and it'll be on the Molecules Unlimited thing um, after, the, after we've finished. Thank you. It's amazing. Happy. It's amazing Happy. how many people don't look at the sign and see the water and think, oh, I can drive that. No, they can't. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, and yeah, I would encourage everyone to share what you want on the on the group um, site on Facebook or wherever on social media. Let's try and get your wonderful poems out there. Um, so thank you so much for that, Rosie. Um, um, I'd now love to introduce um, someone well known to the group, Isabel Del Rio. Um, thrilled that you're here once again, Isabel. Um, she is a, a British Spanish poet, fiction writer, and linguist born in Madrid. She's lived in London for most of her life. She's published poetry, short stories, novellas, and novels in both English and Spanish. She's also a literary translator, specifically of poetry. So, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, hello and good evening. And it's wonderful to be here. What beautiful poetry we've, we've heard this evening. Um, I usually write free verse, but I sometimes like to work with metered poetry. And I'm going to write, uh, I'm going to read, I wrote it and I'm going to read it, uh, a villanelle, uh, an environmental villanelle, which I wrote for the, this event, uh, a rather uh, a free take on a villanelle. It, it's a poetic form that uh, goes back to the Renaissance. Uh, it has five stanzas of three verses or tercets, and then a single stanza of four verses. In total, it's 19 verses. And the first and the third line of the opening tercet are repeated alternately in the ensuing stanzas. And there are several rhyme pa patterns as well to make it even more complicated. Anyway, I like I like this form very much, and uh, it's it's obsessive, it's uh, cyclical, it's um it's even a little overwhelming, and I think it's appropriate for the environmental turmoil that our planet is suffering at present, very sadly. So it goes like this: It's called flowing water, a villanelle. Flowing water can take many shapes, from streams to rain, from ponds to ice. It is not made, but itself makes. Even at birth, with so much at stake, waters will break, thrown is the dice, for flowing waters can take many shapes. And rolling swiftly on oceans and lakes, waters can turn to either hell or paradise. The reason is that they're not made, but themselves make. And when you need fresh water most, it might be fake, sprung from salt or sand, for even water has a price, since flowing water can take so many shapes. There was no plan, make no mistake. And just like that, water created all, welcoming life. You see, water is not made, but itself makes. And when the very final drop of water burns, it will spell the end and nothing will survive for flowing water had taken far too many shapes and all the things it made were made to dry. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel, lovely. Thank you. Um, yeah, and thanks for explaining why you chose that form as well. That's really interesting. Um, wonderful. 
Okay, I'm going to stop the recording at this point before we carry on.